Uh, Professor Peterson, welcome again to Room for Discussion. Now, lots of controversy has kind of surrounded your visit coming to this platform, and we've even, even made national news. And if one thing's clear from the last five weeks, it's, it's that uh, some people either perceive you as a hero or, or almost as a villain. Um, to what extent do you think you're responsible for causing this polarization of the two camps? Um, well, I'm completely responsible for it. How's that? That's, <laughs> That's great. Well, I'd like to say I'm completely responsible for the hero side and not responsible at all for the villain <laughs> side. <laughs> um, I take responsibility for it. Uh -huh. um, what I think I do is say what I think. And there's consequences to that. Uh -huh. And the consequences unfold, and then I deal with them as I can. So... Um, I'm no fan of collectivists, whether they're on the right or the left, and um, I've aimed most of my thoughts at the collectivist left because they dominate the universities disproportionately, and I'm not happy about that. Mm -hmm. And so it's to their advantage to paint me as villainous and... Um, I suppose to some degree that's the case because there's a little bit of villain in everyone. Oh. But um, mostly it's just the same tired ideological cliches that are put in place of reasoned investigation and discussion. And I do my best to dispel those. Or perhaps I allow people to dispel that for themselves. I mean, part of the reason that I've still moving forward, let's say, is that when the political controversy broke around me in Canada, I already had 300 hours of video content online. And so people could go and make up their own minds, which they did. And so the, the ratio of public support to antipathy towards what I'm doing runs at about 50 to 1. So that's fine, as far as I'm concerned. But do you not also want to kind of foster a convergence between the groups? Like, even though, as you said, what you said has a consequence and people are free to follow what they do, don't you think you have some kind of responsibility to, to at least bring these uh, polarized camps together? Yes. Uh, I think I've done all sorts of... Uh, I've done many things to do that. I'm working with a group of people who are trying to modify uh, the democratic position in the United States with the Democrats, to try to bring them back to the center and away from the radical left. Um, I think that my lectures provide a way out for people with regards to ideological possession, regardless of whether they're on the left or the right. Um, and my sense is, and certainly what I've encountered in terms of the people that I've spoken to, and that's many thousands of people now, that um, most of the people who are listening to my lectures, instead of reading about them in the New York Times, let's say, almost always modify their views, both psychologically and politically. Mm -hmm. I'm not particularly interested in the political element, by the way, I'm interested in the psychological element. And um, that's often obscured by the press coverage because most journalists would rather be politicians. and they only see the world in political terms. And so if you do something that's not political, they have no idea what to do with it. So they have to cast it one way or another. Well, you must be left, you must be right, you must... It's like, no, I'm not playing a political game. Well, there are, every game is political. It's like, mm -hmm. no, it's not. That's just how you see things. So, um, and as far as I'm concerned, the non-political game I'm playing is working just fine. So... Um, well, I think it's, it's without any doubt that you helped a lot of people and that you have a lot of fans. But if, you, if we look, for example, to, um, to, the, to the reaction in your blog, you really choose to, uh, to attack, especially on, on certain moments in the blog. Like, why, why, do, why do you do that? Gloves are off when it comes to professors. Okay. They're part of my crowd, let's say. Mm -hmm. And when I see them write a letter that's that incoherent 
and then sign it so carelessly, then it's perfectly reasonable to put up a, let's call it vigorous defense. I mean, one of the most comical things about that letter, I thought, was the attempt by the authors of the letter and, and by implication, the signatories, to go after me for, for the insufficiency of my scientific objectivity. I mean, first, I thought that was just absolutely beyond the pale, mm -hmm. given that the people who occupy the ideological position that would compel them to write that letter are critics of the very idea of scientific objectivity itself. And so it's quite convenient for them to uh, be critics of the idea that that even exists and then also to claim that, well, despite the fact that it doesn't exist, they happen to be much better at it than me. Yeah. So it's like, really? Well, so, yeah, that, and that was only, I mean, that letter could be taken apart line by line, which yeah. I didn't do. Yeah. I only took it apart paragraph yeah. by paragraph. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, no, but I think, I think it's clear, because I, I think what you're saying is that if academics cross a line, then you choose to attack. Is that, is that a correct... Well, it's not so much attack. It's more like defend. Defend. Okay. You know, it's not like I wrote a letter to 80 academics at the University of Amsterdam accusing yeah. them of whatever I might accuse them of. Yeah. So, and I don't think that uh, a, a rousing defense is not an attack, even though it might not be uh, particularly happily received by those, on, uh, those that the defense is aimed at. Yeah. So, um, and, you know, given, as I said, if it's professors, then, then I'm more likely to be uh, let's say, less circumspect in my criticism. And I think that's correct, because they're, a mem the member, they're members of the academy just like I am. And so we're on home ground, let's say. And then they also have a responsibility to the students, which I think um, is often abdicated, especially when a letter like that is constructed so incoherently. Yeah. Okay, clear. There are many different groups right now in society who all have, as we, have we, as we experience also um, with this case, who have their own opinions, and those opinions are sometimes very strong. And over the past years, I think we saw that the ex extremes became way more visible, if you, for example, look to Charlottesville, and the, and the center voices are often a bit overshadowed, almost. What do you think that says about the public debate? Do you think there's still a room for discussion in the debate? I, I don't think it says, I don't think it says much about the public debate. Mm -hmm. I think it's mostly the consequence of a technological transformation. Mm -hmm. I think that as the mainstream media collapses mm -hmm. um, under the weight of this technological onslaught that's constituted by the web and, and by YouTube and by podcasts, that um, their, their professionalism declines <laughs> okay, so someone is asking to all sit down so we all can see Jordan Peterson. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Democracy at work. <laughs> so, um, yeah. so what's happening, I think, is, is, two, is twofold. Um, the, the budget for high-quality journalism is being slashed. Mm -hmm. That makes the journalists more desperate and less able to spend time on stories. Um, they're fighting for an increasingly small share of an increasingly dispersed market. And they're much more likely to concentrate on polarized issues and also to imitate each other. And so, um, see, if you look at the situation in the United States, for example, People say, well, it's become more polarized. The data actually indicates that the Republicans, on, by and large, have moved closer to the center and the <coughs> Democrats have moved farther to the left. Yeah. But, and I don't, I don't know what to make of that precisely, um, but in the United States, you know, people were shell-shocked that Trump was elected and they thought about that as indication of increasing polarization. It's like, well, 50% of Americans are Republicans. Yeah, that figures. Is that a fire alarm? I don't, I don't think so, no. 
Ah, oh, that's no, a common, sorry, a a common trick, so I thought that might have been one that was no. pulled. <laughs> so, um, no, that's not a fire alarm. And, and I don't know what Dutch fire alarms sound like. <laughs> it was kind of I think kinda they melodic, sound kind of like that. But, uh, okay. okay, well, anyways, I mean, yeah. it's been four decades, or no, four elections in the United States yeah. where it was 50% Republican and 50% Democrat, yeah. right down the middle and yeah. really tight. Exactly the same thing happened in the last election, so it's like, where's the polarization? It's not happening at the, at, the, at the public level. Now, I mean, Trump is kind of an anomalous candidate, but um, when I look at the American election, I think the idea that Trump won that election is preposterous. Obviously, what happened was Hillary Clinton lost that election, and she roundly deserved it. She abandoned the group of people that could have put her over the top. She chose to campaign in New York and California, primarily, even though she'd already won majorities there, it's like, and she abandoned, the, um, she abandoned key sections of the American working class. Plus, she pandered to the radicals and played identity politics. It's like, it was her presidency to lose, and she certainly managed to lose it, even though she doesn't seem to have completely admitted that yet. Okay. So, to connect with you, uh, to what you just said about identity politics, um, we also want to talk about that for, uh, during the interview, and... Um, we want to start off by saying that today we are, of course, in Amsterdam and it's the capital of the Netherlands. And the Netherlands was the first country in the world who uh, legalized gay marriage, mm -hmm. actually, in two 2001. And so we wanted to start off with a, with a kind of a straightforward question to you. Are you in favor of gay marriage, of legalizing that by law? Well, I'm in favor of marriage mm -hmm. and I'm in favor of the continuity of marriage. And I think it's a reasonable social experiment to extend that the way it has been extended. So, I mean, I mean homosexuality has been around forever. It looks like, particularly on the male end of the distribution, that has a fairly powerful biological component. It seems like a reasonable experiment. I mean, it leaves open questions because we, we have no idea what the long-term viability of such relationships might be compared to heterosexual relationships. That's a completely open question. And we also don't know to what degree it's optimal for the development of children to have both a male and female role model close by. But my suspicions are those things can be um, dealt with in an effective manner. And I suspect that it's better for children to have two parents than one. Now, I think the conservatives who objected to the legalization of gay marriage had their point because they believed that the institution of marriage had had been under sustained assault for a substantial amount of time, which is something I also happen to believe. And so they had their reasons for resisting further change. But I think you can make a strong conservative argument for the utility of, of gay marriage as well as a libertarian or liberal argument. So we'll see. And we've also developed a consensus around that that's pretty much universal across the West. And so that's how we decide things. We develop a consensus. And, uh, it doesn't look like it's ushered in the apocalypse. So, so far, so good. Well, the reason we ask is because... <laughs> Please don't... Well, we actually have a quote of you ab about your opinion on gay marriage uh, and regarding gay marriage in Australia. And you've said, quote, I would be against it if it was backed by cultural Marxists because it isn't clear to me whether it will satisfy the ever-increasing demand for an assault on traditional modes of being. Mm -hmm. um, but don't you think that opposing gay marriage just because it was uh, also, it's also in the agenda, as you say, of uh, cultural Marxists is, is, a, is problematic and it's kind of against your principles uh, as a principally liberal person? Um, I said if, mm -hmm. right? So if you read the quote again, that's what it started with. I mean, it's complicated when, when you're trying to determine what stance to take on a particular issue because it's very complicated to determine just exactly what the issue is. So for example, with this notorious bill C-16, or perhaps my notorious response to it, my, uh, those who regard themselves as my enemies chose to focus on the element of the legislation that, that was relevant to, at least in principle, re relevant to the well-being of transgender people. Now, I'm not so sure it was relevant to the well-being of transgender people, but because I looked at the methodology that was used to uh, do the public surveys, for example, prior to the 
to the introduction of the legislation and they were handled in an absolutely incompetent manner. And, and I think, but the, the issue was with Bill C-16, well, was it about the rights of transgender people or was it about the desire of a certain uh, ideological group to write a social constructionist view of gender into Canadian law or was it about compelled speech? It's like it's not obvious. You have to be a careful diagnostician to make such judgments. I believe that it was fundamentally an issue of compelled speech and the desire to write a social constructionist view of gender into Canadian law. Mm -hmm. And so I opposed it on those grounds. And I think I was correct. Now people could say, well, you know, isn't it rather reprehensible of you to ob object to the extension of rights to transgender individuals? It's like, well, it depends on your level of analysis. Mm -hmm. So well, these are complicated things. It's maybe good that you brought up Bill C-16 because there's also been two recent hot topics. Uh, I don't know if you know, but in the Netherlands three weeks ago, the first uh, official non-gender passport mm -hmm. uh, was given to a Dutch citizen. At the same time, in the US, uh, of course, the new Trump uh, bill, which um, considers to narrowly define gender as something that's immutable and that's totally, cons uh, totally based on genitalia at birth is, is, is now a potential law. Mm -hmm. So if you had to choose between um, these two laws, which one would you pick? Well, if you're transgendered, is it immutable? <laughs> I don't know. Right. Neither does anyone else. And so there's t tremendous incoherencies in the theory. So at the moment, for example, it's perfectly reasonable to formulate the proposition, and, and, and this, is, this is very characteristic of, of let's say, the ideological types who drove Bill C-16 to say you can be man, a man born in a woman's body, which is a biologically determinist argument, and to say that gender is socially constructed, and to say that it's a personal choice. It's like, sorry, all three of those things cannot simultaneously be true. So there's going to be a variety of legislative responses to that, but mostly it's just incoherent. And I also think that it's driven by something deeper. It's driven at least in part by the desire to destabilize uh, traditional perceptual and cognitive categories. And I see that as part of an assault on the idea of categorization itself that's been undertaken with a fair bit of success in the university since the 1970s. And so generally speaking, I'm opposed to such things. I don't believe that introducing confusion about gender identity into the lives of young people at an early age is going to have a net positive consequence. We'll see, but I doubt it. But wouldn't so you be also against the Trump bill? Because, like, as you said, it is also a way in which the law compels a certain identity upon you, which is the reason you opposed Bill 16. So uh, how would you go about, like, what is your position on this? Well, I opposed Bill C-16 because it compelled my speech in a particular manner. Yeah. It wasn't that it compelled an identity upon me. Mm -hmm. It was very specific in that in the entire history of English common law, there has never been legislation that required people to to utter particular phrases. Now you could be, there were limitations on what you could say, that's a whole different thing. And you know, I'm no fan in general of limitations on what you can say, but there are certain legal limitations that are reasonable. You can't incite to crime, for example, and that seems appropriate. But it was a matter of, of compelled expression. And it's also the case that in 1942, the Americans decided at the Supreme Court level that such requirements were unconstitutional. And the fact that it's unprecedented in English common law history and unconstitutional by American standards indicated to me that it was a very bad piece of legislation, mm -hmm. which it most certainly was, especially the gender provision. So here's the argument. Biological sex, gender identity, gender expression, and sexual preference are independent, okay? They're not. The definition of dependent is that there's a strong statistical relationship between them. Could be correlational, could be causal. It is, in fact, causal. It's also correlational. But it's an unbelievably tight linkage so that the overwhelming majority of people who are uh, a particular biological sex identify with that sex. It's 99.97%. Okay. The overwhelming majority of people who are of a given biological sex and an isomorphic gender identity express their gender in accordance with those two uh, fundamental uh, elements of their identity. And that would be more perhaps something in the range of 95%, assuming that 1 in 20 is 
playing with fashion and self-presentation in a gender-bending manner, which is not uncommon. That's been going on for a very long time. And then of the, of the people who are of a given biological sex, the, the isomorphic gender identity, and who present themselves that way, the overwhelming majority are heterosexual. That is not independent. It's the very opposite of independent, even though that's not the, now the law. And then the other element is, there is a strong element of biological proclivity along all of those dimensions. Now, it's not, it's not complete. Obviously, anyone with any sense understands that people are quite mutable in their self and cultural presentation. I mean, we are people, we are creatures with long developmental histories and we can learn. But the idea that biology doesn't play a strong role in influencing phenomena at every, every one of those levels of analysis is absolutely preposterous. And so, and that's pushed very hard by the social constructionists. And I think that's reprehensible. It flies in the face of, of it flies in the face of anything reasonably defined as fact. And it does no one any favors. Well, not least because you can't say, well, you're a man born in a woman's body. It's like, well, is that a biologically determinist argument? Yes or no? So what are we saying? You can be a man born in a woman's body, and that's biological, but if you're a woman born in a woman's body, that's socially constructed. It's like, really? That's supposed to be an argument? That's, it's, it's beyond preposterous. So. Okay, thank you. Is there anyone in the audience who wants to uh, ask a question to Mr. Peterson? And please keep them relatively short. So, Louis, you're gonna pick someone. Choice is yours. <coughs> you, you have to turn it on by pressing the button, Louis. Uh, Hello. <laughs> Hello. Hi, Dr. Peterson. Um, I'd like to start by saying that I really appreciate that you uh, view a lot of your arguments through a species level lens. Uh, with that said, you and your daughter have recently been in the news a lot for your new way of eating. It's been coined the carnivore diet. I wonder how you reconcile this way of eating, which is not exactly environmentally friendly, and your I think your love for our species and hopefully our planet and the idea that you would like to further our species in a positive way. Uh, if more people start eating this way, it would not be the best for our planet or our species. So how it do might you stop them from that? dying. It might stop them from dying. <coughs> so that's, that's been my primary concern with my daughter. Okay, is there a short other question? <coughs> Hello. Um, Hello. <laughs> so I was also at your talk last night. And um, one of the things you mentioned is that you criticized protesters often for being very low resolution. So what do you meant mm. with that if that if they say, okay, they're against poverty or they're for the environment, this is great and amazing, but thank you for like contributing to that. And when I see that, but on the other hand, I feel like those are very complex issues where we also need to have a social conscious of that. So we need to be aware of that as a society so we can deal with that. So I wouldn't say that those statements are necessarily bad because they are important or need to be reinforced so that we can work on complex issues and that people are aware of that as a policy that is important to tackle. Um, well, I mean, there's, there's certainly a variety of ways that important issues need to be brought to public consciousness and sometimes protest is a reasonable way of doing that but as far as I'm concerned it's primarily become institutionalized since the 1960s and is something approximating a rite of passage and it's just rather dull in my estimation and often not helpful. I mean, I, I think it's much better if you're serious about something to try to s go out and solve it. I mean, you have a young man in the Netherlands, Boyan Slat, who's a very good example of that. I don't know how much you know about him, but he's um, invented a device. It's taken him about seven years, and it's been a very difficult process to, and he thinks he can take 50% of the plastic out of the world's oceans in the next five years. It's like, great. That's, that's commitment, man. That's commitment. And he started when he was 17. He did something absolutely impossible. And so, you know, 
he's out to do something for the environment, at least to try. Now, I don't know if it'll work because there's a moral <coughs> hazard involved. If he can take the plastic out of the oceans, it might just encourage reprehensible people to dump more in, and that's definitely a problem. But I'd like to see, and this is something that, you know, I think that students should be encouraged to, to consider in a very serious way. Perhaps there is something about the state of the world that particularly bothers you. And I don't mean for ideological reasons. I mean, for whatever personal reasons, that issue stands out for you. It's mysterious, right? Because some things in the world attract your attention and other things don't. And obviously you can't... Every problem that exists can't be your problem because you would just die of problems. But some problems announce themselves to you as targets of particular concern and those are like beacons for your destiny. So you're very much concerned about something. It's like, great, devote your life to it. See if you can do something about it. And I would say, um, protesting is very, very low on the hierarchy of things that are usefully done if you actually want to solve the problem. Problems are very complex and they're very difficult to solve. And then there's also the, there's also the, the ease of the protest, which is that you can solve your conscience with very little effort and you can go home and feel morally superior and that you've done your duty and you haven't done your duty. You haven't even started to do your duty. You're not even in the universe yet of doing your duty. It's decades of work to address even the smallest component of a very complex problem. So. Okay, yeah. thank you very much for your question. We will, there will be plenty of room uh, for other questions later in the interview. Uh, we want to talk a bit about the relations between men and women right now. Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you, once, you once expressed that um, we don't have the rules, right, between, the, between men and women to successfully work together on the workplace. And we were wondering, what, what do you mean by these rules? Do you mean social rules or do you mean uh, like legal policies? Or how do you, what do you mean by saying this? Um, I, mean, I mean all of those things. I mean day to day. There, there's conflicts that we don't know how to <coughs> resolve exactly. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when you put people together in a workplace, they're obviously going to be concentrating on their work, but they're also going to be people. And so, and people are sexual beings, for example. And so we don't know how to uh, properly balance the inevitability of sexual interactions between people in the workplace and the demands for propriety and efficiency. And so that causes a lot of trouble. So I know NBC now, I think, has a no hugging rule, for example, which yeah, seems a little heavy-handed to me. Um, perhaps it's necessary, but we don't exactly know what is necessary because we don't know how to precisely articulate the boundaries that constitute acceptable behavior. And so, and what are the and the reason for that is that men and women have only been working in hierarchical workplaces of extreme complexity together at, at the level that, that we experience now for a very short number of decades and it's not surprising that it's taking us a while to work out the bugs. Yeah. So and what, what would you define as the concrete problems that then arise right now? Well, part of the problems are, um, for example, how you define in unacceptable sexual behavior. And so exa for example, the National Academy of Science just released a report to dignify it with the name of report, in my estimation, that, that indicates that 50% of women in STEM fields experience sexual harassment in a given year. Whereas the corresponding figure for one of the latest uh, studies that was done by the Australian government is 0.08%. Well, that's a big difference. And the difference stems, at least in part, as a consequence of definition. And the problem with something like sexual harassment which isn't a scientific category, right? It's not a proper set. It doesn't have defined inclusion and exclusion boundaries, like all triangles, for example. So the borders of the concept are very fuzzy and they're partly sociocultural in nature and you can twist and bend them in one direction or another to suit your purposes, which is clearly, in my estimation, what happened with the National Academy of Science report. Well, their recommendations are that we restructure the STEM fields 
so that they're, for example, less hierarchical because hierarchical structures are obviously what are driving sexual misbehavior on the part of men in the STEM fields. All of those propositions are completely, they may be true, but they're completely unfounded. There's no evidence that there's true. they're true, and there's certainly no evidence that restructuring these enterprises uh, by modifying their hierarchical structure is going to produce the, the desired end, especially when you can't get the initial measurements right to begin with. We don't know the rules. So what are the rules? No relationships that are sexual in the workplace. Is that going to be the rule? Well, what does that mean exactly? Does that mean no flirtatious behavior? Does that mean no jokes? Like, what does it mean? Does it mean no long glances? Because there are corporate policies in the United States that are already regulating the amount of time that you can look at each other. Right? Yeah. So, so we don't know what to do about this. Now, generally what you do is try to um, comport yourself like a reasonable and decent human being, which is a mode of being that's so complex that it can't be articulated fully in dogmatic legalization, right? You can't make a policy of reasonable behavior. I don't know, the document would be 500 feet thick because it would have to cover every possible eventuality. But is there a way then to approve, uh, to, um, to make those rules better? Is there, is there a solution to the problem? Because of course, like uh, the, the example you named with uh, limiting the amount of time looking in, into somebody's eyes is, yeah. eyes is quite bizarre, but is there, is there something we can do together to in achieve a better situation on the workplace? Well, I would say, see, I wouldn't conceptualize the solution at that level of the problem. I mean, what I'm trying to do is to encourage people to be more responsible individuals. And I think if the workplace was populated by more responsible individuals, then many of these problems would go away. So, but that's a low, rather low resolution r a solution to that particular problem, but I don't see a better one at the moment. So, you know, um, don't comport yourself in a reprehensible manner. What does that mean? A lot of the misbehavior that, that, that people object to is driven by such things as excess alcohol consumption. So one of the things you might recommend if you're in the workplace and you want to be careful is be careful. One drink with dinner with colleagues might be plenty. Ten might be pushing your luck. Now, you know, I'm a little loath to say that because I also know that people need to blow off steam and they need to have some fun. But it's dangerous and the borders will be pushed and, that will be, and there will be consequences to that. And so we don't know exactly what to do about that. So, you know, do you, have to be, if, do you have to be more careful in a mixed gender setting than you have to be in a single gender setting? It seems to me that the accumulating evidence, uh, the accumulating evidence suggests that you do have to be more careful. And that's a problem in and of itself because w one of the things that we're striving for is equality of treatment in the workplace. And I don't know how you get equality of treatment in the workplace if you also have to be more careful in mixed gender settings. Maybe it's possible, but I don't know how it's possible. So, so, but, it, but again, it's not that surprising because we've only been at this for, you know, a short number of decades and yeah. these are very complicated problems. So maybe time will tell. Too. Yes, and, and well, and, and the other thing too is that many occupations are sorting themselves out spontaneously by gender and we also don't know what the consequences of that is going to be. That's happening at an accelerating rate. So, um, and w w no, one, no one knows the social consequences of that. I mean, one of the, one of the, the, um, one of the interesting um, uh, consequences of that is that, for example, in the universities, m the majority of the female-dominated disciplines are politically correct. So that's interesting as far as I'm concerned, and, and I'm not sure why it's the case, but it's definitely something that has social ramifications. And yeah, we will also talk about that later in the interview, Kay. actually. Um, I now want to shortly um, talk with you about, you, m you expressed multiple times that you uh, are in favor of uh, equality of opportunity mm -hmm. between men and women, uh, but not in favor of equality of outcome because of biological, dif for example, biological differences. Well, equality of outcome is fine. I'm not in favor of the enforcement of equality of outcome. Yeah. I mean, if 
outcomes happen to be equal, well, yeah. Yeah. fine, maybe that would yeah. be great. It doesn't happen. But the thing is, is that, and, and, and the data are strongly in support of this, unless you don't believe data, and of course you don't have to, but then you have to throw out. I believe data, so that's, uh, well, that's fine. Um, so, so this is what's happened. So it turns out that as you increase the wealth of a society, and you tilt it towards egalitarianism, that you radically increase the magnitude of the differences between men and women in terms of temperament and interest. And so I should tell you how big that effect is, because it's actually unbelievably big. So the last paper that was published on this phenomenon was published in Science uh, a week and a half ago, and so Science is uh, the premier scientific journal in the world. It's a sufficiently influential journal so that if you're a scientist and you publish one paper in science that permanently establishes your professional reputation. So it's the gold standard along with nature of scientific accomplishment and the last paper was published on, the, on this issue in science. A very large sample and the correlation between an index that was a combination of national wealth and egalitarianism and the magnitude of differences in preference between men and women was 0.7. And 0.7 is a larger correlation than is reported in 99% of social science papers. It's bigger than the correlation between IQ and academic achievement. So it's among the largest effects ever discovered by social scientists in any domain considering any phenomenon. And it's been replicated three times in the last month alone and, and, suffic and sufficiently replicated now so that even the London Times three weeks ago stated forthrightly that it's one of the most, if not the most, well-documented finding in the social sciences. So this is the finding. As you make a more egalitarian social environment, the differences between men and women in personality and interest magn magnify. And so we'll concentrate on interest and preference and leave temperament aside because interest and preference is probably more relevant to occupational choice. So the biggest difference between men and women that we know of, psychologically speaking, is preference for people versus things. And men tilt towards preference for things, and women tilt towards preference for people. Now, the, di the distribution still overlap to a substantial degree. Um, but most of the forces that drive occupational selection are driven by the extremes of the distribution and not the central tendency. So for example, if you're going to be an engineer, you're going to be one of those people who's really interested in things. Because if you're just sort of interested in things, well, you're not going to be an engineer. And it turns out that almost all the people who are really interested in things are men. So, in the Scandinavian countries, as is also the case in the Netherlands, the vast majority of engineers are men, just like the vast majority of nurses are women. Could I shortly interrupt you? Because I actually want to connect to that. For example, in the Scan Scandinavian society, so it's very egalitarian and therefore so you have an, an there's an equality of opportunity mm -hmm. and that results uh, for the reasons you just explained in in an inequality of outcome right see that's that's exactly the cru crucial issue yeah we could be it could easily be that our attempts to produce equality of opportunity are run contrary to the desire to produce equality okay, of outcome okay i was outcome. actually mm. trying to point that out wouldn't that be a nasty thing <laughs> Mm. Because if the outcome is, if the outcome is unequal, so if some bis uh, some fields are dominated primarily by men and yeah. others by women, so if you, for example, look to big multinationals are primarily dominated by men, uh, like in the top positions, so for example, not in the sale divisions. But if you look to uh, nurses, there are, there are way more uh, women who are nurses. Mm -hmm. um, but by that inequality of outcome, which is a result actually of equality of opportunity, mm -hmm. that that inequality of outcome then also results in an inequality of opportunity in some sense, right? Because then it becomes harder for, for example, a man to right. uh, make make a career in in in, in yeah nursing. yeah yeah you get you get uh, so how those are Pareto distribution problems yeah yeah, yeah so how would you then solve that oh I don't know I don't think anybody knows how to solve that like that the the inequality problem is a really deep one. One of the things that I lecture about quite regularly on, on my lecture tour is um, it's a critique of Marxism, uh, at least in part. Um, so there's a there's room on the on the right 
left-hand side of the spectrum, politically, because we need to produce hierarchies, because the reason that you produce a hierarchy, generally speaking, is because society has identified a goal that's valuable, and then people have to organize themselves to pursue that goal, and that organization tends rapidly to become hierarchical, and the reason for that is that some people are better at pursuing the goal than others. It doesn't matter what the goal is. And not only that, some people are radically better at pursuing the goal. So, um, in fact, th th there's actual mathematical estimates of that, and they basically run in the following manner. So, um, the square root of the number of people pursuing a goal will do half of the productive work. And it's a vicious, vicious formula. It, it governs scientific publication, for example, almost perfectly, and that was discovered by DeSola Price back in 1962. So if you have 100 scientists working in a, on a given problem, 10 of them produce half the publications. But if you have 1,000 scientists working on the same problem, then 30 of them produce half the publications. It's a vicious, vicious proclivity towards producing steep hierarchies. Now, you need hierarchies because you can't solve problems without them. But the problem with hierarchies is they dispossess people. And so that's the point, that's the place for the left. Because the left can say, look, careful with the hierarchy there. You're dispossessing people. They stack up at the bottom, and that's not good for those people. Because, for example, it forecloses opportunity in the future, especially over multiple generations. It might, uh, it might stop you from maximally utilizing the talent that's available in your society, and the hierarchy can become rigid and unmoving and intransigent and corrupt across time. Yeah. So you need the right and the left to have it out about how the hierarchy sh could be structured. The, the, the problem is, though, a as you pointed out, is that once inequality starts out, it can really spiral rapidly. So, because one of the things I wonder about, for example, you see men uh, ba bailing out of the humanities at a very rapid rate. So maybe, maybe there's a rule, something like, you can have 40% men and 60% women, or 60% men and 40% women in a discipline, and that is an equilibrium. That'll maintain itself. But if you get 65% men, or 65% women, then it goes to 100%. And it could easily be that, because you get these positive feedback loops developing in complex systems that you can't control. But would you then, would you then think it's favorable to, um, to have a mechanism or some kind of rules or a quota or whatever to not ensure... Not Why not? Because I think that the risks outweigh the benefits, because I think the best you can do... And I studied uh, assessment of talent for a very long time, for about 30 years, and I think the best you can do is to define the function of the hierarchy, not that that's easy, because it's often very difficult, but you, that's the best you can do, is to carefully define the function of the hierarchy, and then select on the basis of competence in relationship to that function. Now, that's going to produce trouble, but every selection method produces trouble. That one will just produce the least trouble. And so you don't consider extraneous variables, as far as I'm concerned, partly because there's an infinite multitude of them. It's like, okay, what are you going to equalize across? What are the canonical groups? Sex, ethnicity, race, yep. gender. Who says? That's a very small subset of the potential universe of canonical groups. Why are those, why are those the right groups? And let's say it is race. Well, what races? Are there three? Are there 50? There's more genetic diversity in Africa than there is in the rest of the world. So it's like, how much do you fractionate race? And then how much do you fractionate gender? And, and what about class, attractiveness, personality, temperament, IQ? All of these things yeah, so you would say that we enter a realm then of almost infinite amount of different... Sure, well, the, the intersectional theorists already figured this out, although they didn't notice it because they're not very bright. <laughs> so they thought, oh, um, well, history is an oppressor, oppressive, oppressor, oppressor, uh, victim, victimizer narrative. Okay, across what dimensions? Groups. What groups? Well, here's the four canonical groups, arbitrarily chosen, but nonetheless, fair enough. Oh, well, we have a problem. What if you belong to more than one of those groups? Well, then what's your oppression? Well, it's either the sum or the product of your group membership. It's like, fair enough. How many group memberships are there? Well, there's an uncountable number. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, all you have to do is do the arithmetic. It's like, imagine you belong to 10 groups. And, and the probability, maybe the probability that you'll belong to those, let's say there are only 10 groups, so your position in each of those 10 groups has a probability of 1 in 10. 
And so your identity is the product of 1 in 10 times 1 in 10 times 1 in 10, so forth, up to 10, which means there's one of you. Well, that's the individual. That's why the West figured this out, like 2,000 years ago. The proper category for a human being is the individual, because that's the only category that takes into account, as well as it can be taken into account, the diversity. And, and you can't gerrymander that with group identity. It doesn't work. So we're going to go for equality of outcome. Okay, across what dimensions? Oh, well, we didn't think about that. Oh, well, that's an intractable problem. It's not, oh, we made a small mistake and we can still go for equality of outcome. It's like, no, that's a fatal error. Just like the error of assuming you can pursue equality of opportunity and equality of outcome. I mean, look, I should tell you too, it's not like this data that indicated that men and women got more different as societies got more egalitarian was something that social scientists were out having a like cake party about. It was a bloody shock to everyone. No one suspected or expected this. And, and no one even believed it until it kept being replicated over and over and over. You know, I think the general consensus among psychologists 30 years ago, and, and they were fairly liberal as a group even then, and are far more liberal and left-leaning now, was that mm -hmm. as we made societies more egalitarian and more wealthy, that men and women would become more the same. Yeah. Didn't happen. So, light, you know, reality doesn't necessarily manifest itself in accordance with our deepest ideological hopes. And now we don't know what to do about that. Now, my sense is that what we should do is let men and women make their choices. Now, there's going to be consequences to that, and the point you made is a really good one, because those, you, know, you can get these spirals where you might end up with like zero female engineers or zero male school teachers. And you might think, well, there's, there's, there's potential negative consequences to that from a social perspective, and, and there could well be. But I don't know a better technique for for uh, um, allowing people entry into a hierarchy than to judge them on the basis of the measures of competence that are in keeping with the function of the hierarchy. So th that's the least destructive mode of discrimination, because there's going to be discrimination. Unless, I suppose you could assign membership in the hierarchies randomly. You know, that would solve the problem, but then it wouldn't work because you wouldn't get competence. Yeah. So, you know, and you end up with situations like Harvard, like you had, you, you had 50% chance of being accepted to Harvard if you were Asian. Like, <laughs> that was a consequence of, of, e of these, these group identity social policies. And I know why Harvard did it. I knew the people when I was there who ran the admissions sections. And most of them were very decent people. And they were trying to, in, in many ways, trying to do exactly what they said. They were trying to diversify the student body along multiple dimensions. But one of the con I mean, this is a big consequence that you had a 50% disadvantage if you were Asian. That's not trivial. It, it's actually unforgivable in my estimation. I hope Harvard gets walloped in the courts, and then I hope that they're subject to a very large class action suit, because that is what should happen in, in my estimation. Okay, maybe at this point we could turn to the audience for another question. A quick question, please. Maybe someone from the back a little bit. No, not too back. <laughs> From so you oppressed people at the back. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Jordan. Uh, my question is, what is the antidote towards toxic masculinity? Well, the, uh, the antidote is responsible masculinity. And, and what does responsible mean? It means, well, if, if you're responsible, then you're trying to do, um, you're trying to do what's honest first. So you're careful with your speech and your actions. You're careful with your speech in that you don't say things that you know to be false. And you're careful in your actions so that you don't have to lie about what you do. That's a good start. And then the next thing would be that you're capable of taking responsibility for yourself at least so that once you're an adult, no one else has to bend over backwards to ensure that you don't unduly suffer in the world. And so that's responsibility for yourself. And then if you get halfway as good at that, well, then, you know, you might think about taking on the responsibility of a family and contributing to your community and doing all those things in a harmonious manner. And that's obviously the antidote to toxic masculinity, which is not a phrase I would generally use. I just think about it as, 
you know, a, a, what would you call it? I think sinful behavior is a much more accurate representation personally, but it's honesty and, and responsibility. And I do think about it as a, harm, a function of harmony. I got that a lot from reading Jean Piaget, whose work was a ex, uh, psychological extension of Kant's c categorical imperative, because Kant believed that you should act in a manner such that if the way you acted became a universal, that that would be beneficial. And, but Piaget formalized that very nicely, showing that um, one of the basis for the emergence of, of a system of genuine ethics was a, uh, an iterable form of reciprocity. So that, you know, so for example, oh, I can give you a quick example of that. My granddaughter, who's now 15 months old, has discovered a new game. And it's, 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 it's a Piagetian game, um, a developmental game. And she, she discovered this by watching, but also on her own, and partly because it's a very deep part of human nature. So she has this little wooden spoon. And her game is, you sit with her at the table, and her game is, she gives you the spoon. And then you take it. And then you give it back. And then she's all happy about that. And then she gives the spoon to the, to the person who's sitting beside her. And then they give it back to her, and she's very happy about that. And so it's, it's an amazing game, because she's learned to give up something, to, to let go of something that she wants, and to trust someone else to return it to her, and that's what she's playing with. And then you can play with that game, it's quite fun, and so, you know, and you have to pay careful attention to her and watch how she's manifesting her emotions, and so maybe what you do is you take the spoon and you hide it under your hand, and that sort of disconcerts her a bit, then you show it to her, and pick it up and give it to her, and she's happy about that, because what she sees is that the principle of reciprocity can maintain itself across a set of transformations, and that's really exciting to her. Or you can give her the spoon, and she can give it back to you, and then she can reach for it, and you can pull it away a quarter of an inch. And that sort of disconcerts her. And then she'll... You, do you Did want you, to repeat oh, sorry, that? I'm sorry. Um, I said that didn't cover really a toxic ma masculinity, right? Because yes, it's no, dealing no, with the just, just, just dealing with the principle just, of reciprocity. No, you, you just said that you, you have to be honest and res respons uh, responsible as a man. Right? Well, put it this way: when I'm giving the spoon back to my granddaughter, I'm not engaging in toxic masculinity. And that was the point that I was trying to make: is that and this deep reciprocity and trust is part of the social contract, and it is precisely the antidote to. What precisely, it, since we're going to pursue this, what precisely is toxic masculinity? As opposed to, say, toxic femininity or toxic humanity. What exactly are you asking me about? Well, I, I really want to know what, what you like, uh, how you would s describe to toxic masculinity. Because no, I want you to define what to toxic masculinity constitutes. Since we're going to define things so carefully, let's do it. Well, I think okay, guys, sorry, but we really have to move on. So there will be more <laughs> questions later on. <laughs> there will be a lot of opportunity no, to but ask questions. Maybe let's, if, if you, if you... <laughs> okay, so let's define it shortly. All right, shortly, please. Uh, okay, um, I think that the, the moment when you kind of, um, I, I, I have a hard time to kind of describe it in English. Um, let's say, uh, gosh, um, that you kind of, um, go over a boundary that kind of uh, neglect, neglects the freedom of the opposite, well, gender or whatsoever. So that's, that's mas toxic masculinity and that you kind of have But this that would also be toxic femininity. Well, can, may, may I like finish my sentence, sure. please? Sure. Thank you. Um, and then also, um, you, I lost my sentence now. But, um, <laughs> no, 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 I will be back. I'm back, I'm back. <laughs> but more in the sense that, yeah, can someone help me here in the audience? Okay, so let, before, before we move on, let me point something out, you know, that I was willing to, to undertake this uh, line of discussion, allowing for the possibility that the category of toxic masculinity had some content, right? But if we're, if we're going to pursue that line of reasoning and quibble about the answer, then we're certainly going to quibble about the definition that's embedded in the question. And so part of what's happened in our discourse is that we're required ethically to assume a priori merely out of politeness that the utterance toxic masculinity actually constitutes a meaningful phrase. And if you push it, you find very rapidly that it doesn't. 
because it's very, very, very difficult to define and definitions actually matter. And so if it's a matter of transgressing against the boundaries of gender appropriate behavior, well, first of all, that indicates that there's something universal and normative about gender appropriate behavior, which is something that people who push the idea of toxic masculinity generally tend not to presume. And second, it's just as likely to happen among women as among men, in which case it's not toxic masculinity. So maybe on to the next question. Okay. We will, we will shortly ask one or two questions and then we will open up uh, for completely open up to the public. No, but we can continue the conversation after one or two questions and then we will open up. So, because um, you, um, there is this, um, okay, so you have freedom of speech and you often express that you're uh, very much against political correctness. So, um, how, how I would define that is putting societal boundaries on free speech. Would you, would you, short, just, can I continue? Is that a good definition of political correctness in your opinion? No. Okay, <laughs> how would you define it? Well, political correctness is something that I see as having been primarily formulated in the early 1970s. I think it's a unholy marriage, so to speak, between Marxism and po postmodernism. And I've been criticized for that view because people say, well, it can't be a marriage between postmodernism and Marxism because postmodernism is predicated on skepticism towards meta narratives, and Marxism is a meta narrative, so obviously there can't be any postmodern Marxists. And my reply to that is, well, yes, clearly that's the case from the perspective of pure coherence, but that doesn't seem to matter because there are plenty of postmodern Marxists. And that's not my problem because I can't distinguish between them conceptually, it's just the manner in which things have laid themselves out. It was a movement that was primarily a consequence of um, activity among French intellectuals in the early 70s, and to me it was in part a consequence of two things. It was a, it was a consequence of the demise of the intellectual and moral credibility of Marxism, especially in the aftermath of the revelations of the, of the Stalinist and Maoist atrocities that characterized much of the 20th century. So, and so that was one of, one of the, um, what would you call, motivating factors because mm -hmm. all the people who held those Marxist viewpoints had to find another avenue of expression for their ideological commitments. And, um, but then the second one, and th this is a deeper one, is that um, there has been a very troublesome epistemological problem that's emerged in multiple fields since the early 1960s in artificial intelligence and in psychology and in literary criticism and the problem is attendant on the discovery that there's a virtually infinite number of ways of categorizing a finite number of objects and so what that means is th this is this is integrally tied in for example with the difficulty that AI pioneers had in producing um, machines that could perceive the world because we thought that the world was made out of sort of discriminable objects in in their Mm -hmm. what self-evident categories and that was just there for the perceiving and that turned out to be seriously wrong and so the postmodernist types ran across this problem they thought well um, how many interpretations are there of a Shakespeare play and the answer is innumerable interpretations and and then the next problem is well then how do you rank order those innumerable yeah. interpretations in terms of quality and that's a major problem and so political correctness is well it's an those are its sources, but it turns out, practically speaking, that it's an amalgam of a rather nihilistic strain of postmodernism with a rather desperate strain of Marxism. So, okay, thank you. But I, 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 I wanted to talk about either not regulating free speech at all and putting some societal boundaries on. Well, there already are legal boundaries on free speech. Of course, yeah. But for example, in the U.S., yeah, th there are there are very little. But yep. uh, let, let me let me um, look together with you to an to an example. If, if for example, in the 2016 elections with mm -hmm. Donald Trump, mm -hmm. there was a lot of uh, it's proven that there was some fake news and some hate speech circulating on those um, platforms, mm -hmm. which was not actually true, and it reached a lot of people. Yeah. Would you and uh, Facebook and Twitter are now regulating? those uh, those posts, posts? No, they're trying to regulate them. Yeah, they're trying to regulate oh. them. So would you be in favor of regulating that? Or would you say don't regulate at all? Good luck to Twitter and Facebook regulating their content. Okay. Good luck to them, man. They've bitten off something that they'll never swallow. 
Yeah. So, so and what? who's going to regulate it? So look, am I look, am I in favor of a system that would ensure that all we ever received from the media was truth? Sure. If such a system could be produced, but I don't think for a second that that's even vaguely possible, even technically possible. It's like who decides? But the alternative is No, no, but it doesn't matter what the alternative is. The no, question is mm-hmm. who decides? It's the only question. No, I do agree with you. That's very difficult to decide that. But it's not difficult. It's, it's impossible, impossible, you would say. Mm. And there's a big difference between difficult and impossible. And then what happens is those who choose to regulate end up being precisely those who you would not want to regulate. Now, the way we solved that problem in the West was you can say your stupid thing and I can say my stupid thing and all these people who are just as biased and ignorant as the two of us can listen and we can all come to our determination about what constitutes truth and that's the best we're ever going to be able to do and okay. I believe that so yeah. so and I don't see any improvement on that okay, okay let's close off with the final yeah. final question maybe to conclude the question so we've looked at the individual from various perspectives what do you th- think the role of the individual is now that we're li- living in a world with different groups and different conditions, how would you see the role of the individual in society in the future? I Are you optimistic about it? Yes, fundamentally. And the reason I'm optimistic is partly because I'm very deeply pessimistic by nature and I've looked at a very large number of terrible things both in my studies and in my personal life and in my private practice. And my conclusion has been that despite the vast um, ocean of ignorance that we all swim in and the overwhelming proclivity for malevolence that characterizes the human psyche, that the nobility that's part and parcel of us and the potential can transcend that and defeat it. And so it's very dark but there's something very bright at the bottom. And so I'm very optimistic about that, and that's part of the reason that I'm, well, that I wrote the book that I wrote, but also that I'm touring around the world, talking to people about adopting something, approximating a vision that's noble and worthy, and setting their speech straight, and getting their lives together, and shouldering the responsibility of the world in a manner that's good for them and their family, and their communities, and to think about that as an aspirational goal that provides them with the meaning to offset the tragedy of their life. And I believe that's solid, right to the core, and my impression is that it's that knowing that, hearing that, which is something that all people already know in some sense, but hearing that articulated clearly is of great utility to people. And every time someone comes up to me, and this happens very often, uh, multiple times a day, no matter where I am, and someone comes up to me and says, um, excuse me, are you Dr. Peterson? And they usually say that very politely, and they're apologetic for disturbing me, even though they're not disturbing me. They say, "Um, look, I was having a rough time a couple of years ago, addicted, alcoholic, lonesome, disturbed in my personal relationships. I've been watching your lectures, listening to your books, listening to your podcasts. Things are much better. Thank you. It's like every time that happens, it's overwhelming. I'm sorry it always breaks me up, but it's very overwhelming. (laughs) You see. It's very overwhelming to have strangers come up and tell you things that they won't tell people that are close to them. You know, it indicates that they trust, that there's a trust there, that's a deep trust, because the people who are doing this, they come up and tell me that because they're very pleased about it, but also because they know that I'll be pleased about it. And I am overwhelmingly pleased about it. And so, and for me, every time I hear something like that, that's a victory, you know. I studied the structure of totalitarianism for a very long time and became a very firm believer in the idea of good and evil. And I do believe that 
the most appropriate way to conceptualize the nature of human experience and it is as a battle between good and evil. And I think it's a very serious battle because the evil is very dark and very terrible. And every time I see someone who has reoriented themselves in, in an upward direction, then I regard that as part of what defeats that terrible malevolence and bitterness. And, and I uh, believe that the fundamental doctrine that each individual is a center of creation, I believe that to be literally and metaphorically true. And, and I also believe that each of us partake, participate in the process of transforming what could be into what is, and that we do that as a consequence of our ethical choices, and that we shape the world as a consequence of that. And so then when I hear someone come up to me and say, look, you know, I've, I've done everything I could in the last while to put myself together, and it's, and it's much less dark around me, I think. That's one more major victory on the bitter road uphill. So. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, if you do a few questions, yeah. Shall we open up? So, is there anyone from the audience who wants to ask a question? Luis, again, uh, can you? So, we have some questions coming in from our audiences at CREA, so I would like to start <laughs> off with some questions from them first. Okay, let's do one from, from Kea and then yes. one from, from here. So, an audience member at CREA asks, how do we acknowledge that there are disadvantaged groups in society that need help while also acknowledging differences? Well, I don't, think it's, I don't think it's particularly challenging to acknowledge that there are disadvantaged groups that's, or people, and that seems self-evident. I mean, there are multiple dimensions of advantage, and with each dimension of advantage comes a dimension of disadvantage, and that's obviously a problem. I mean, and, and it's a really deep problem which is partly why I'm interested in, in criticizing the Marxist critique of the West and capitalism. It's like the Marxists like to lay inequality at the feet of the West. The capitalism, for example, that's naive beyond belief. Inequality is a way worse problem than, than something that you can attribute to capitalism. It's far, far deeper than that. And so if you're really concerned with the dispossessed, you're going to come up with a more sophisticated explanation for why people are dispossessed than the existence of capitalism. I mean, you can analyze Neolithic grave sites if, 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 if you want to, to, to detect the existence of inequality. Our forebears tens of thousands of years ago were buried with grave treasures that indicate a predo distribution of wealth well before anything approximating a capitalist society emerged. And that's just a human example. I mean, so inequality is a very deep problem. What do we do about it? Well, that's, that's an eternal that's an eternal question. I mean, I think what we do mostly is try to in ensure that our hierarchies are fair, and, and that means that at least they're based on competence and that they're oriented to something of value. But then I would also say that the hierarchies themselves have to follow the same ethical presuppositions that I described in relationship to the individual. It's like, let's say you're leading a company. Well, hopefully that's good for you. Hopefully it's good for your family. Hopefully it's also good for the community. And you should be concerned with ensuring that that's the case across all three of those levels simultaneously. And maybe if you're very careful, although this starts to get, what would you say, almost impossibly <laughs> difficult, might be not so bad to see if you could find out a way of doing it that was okay for the environment as well. But the environment, that's a lot of variables. So that starts to become intractably difficult. So I think if you conduct yourself ethically, let's say as a business person, then that's one way of aiding the dispossessed. That's certainly the case. You could be generous personally. That would be helpful. You could take care of your family. If you have some time left over to directly aid people who are in trouble, if you have the, what, the wisdom and the caution and the judgment to do that without making the situation worse, which is very, very difficult, then 
more power to you. I hope you can manage that. And so each of us has a responsibility to manage that in the way that we can, them, in the best way that we can imagine and implement. And, and it's a crucial issue, which is why the left, for example, on the, on the political spectrum has a place. Someone has to speak for the dispossessed. But that's not the same as resentment for the successful. Those are not the same thing. And dis discriminating between them is very, very difficult. And I would say if you're overwhelmed with compassion for the dispossessed, you should ask yourself very carefully how much of that is driven by hatred for the successful. Now, maybe it's very little, and maybe you're a saint, but probably not. Okay, thank you very much. Is there uh, maybe someone who is standing up? Yeah, Luis, maybe we go a bit to the back. A bit to the back. This is a kind of, of, uh, of a topic, but as a Jungian as I, as I as a psychologist, what kind of archetypes would you say President Trump has in him, or does he represent? Well, there's a bit of the fool, and I, I'm being dead serious, like because he's got a trickster element to him, eh? So, and you can see that by the way he plays on Twitter. And he's bombastic, and he's certainly an entertainer, so he's highly, highly extroverted. So there's a public performer element to him. Um, and, you know, from the Jungian perspective, the, the fool is a precursor to the savior, right? Because the fool is often the only person who can tell the truth. And I think that one of the things that happened in the last presidential election is that people regarded Trump not everyone, obviously, and only a tiny mi majority of people, but many people regarded Trump as more honest than Clinton because his foolish, impulsive lies were more trustworthy than her carefully scripted, ideologically planned lies. So, uh, and I'm, 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 dead, I'm dead serious about that. Like, there's something, there's something about his, his uh, uncontrollable, relatively uncontrollable impulsivity that reveals him in a way that someone who's all persona, which was certainly the case with Clinton and her, uh, and her teams of persona constructors, they never let the real person out. Same thing happened with Al Gore in election, you know, a, a couple of cycles before that. And so I think people, given those choices, they, 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 went, for the, they went for the trickster. And so, and so that's, that's the archetype I would see at work there. Now there's also some there's also some um, devouring mother, tyrannical father dynamic that played out in the last election as well. And so, you know, a critic of Trump would consider him a tyrannical father and a critic of Clinton would consider her a devouring mother. And I think that the electorate also tilted slightly towards preferring the devouring trickster father to the persona compassionate devout or the tyrannical trickster father, rather than the devouring, compassionate mother. But it was, you know, it was a knife edge. It was a knife edge. Okay, thank you. Is there somebody else? I think so, yeah. <laughs> so, Luis, maybe b go a bit to the that side of the room. Yes. A very well prepared Thank question. You. Yep. Um, you've mentioned the word uh, ethics a couple of times, uh, therefore, this question. Um, can you define what you personally find of intrinsic value that should be part of an objective uh, debate where uh, we find a decent balance between tolerance and the freedom of speech? Um, and, um, well, do I, can I continue? <laughs> <laughs> I want to keep it short. And, um, I mean, can you mention one uh, simple element that uh, we perhaps um, need at this moment to, to that we could like uh, to not oversee uh, that is really crucial to this um, objective debate? Um, and can we also go beyond the notion of left and right? Because we tend to describe and mention these um, 
um, aspects of the political spectrum, but it is very vague. Well, as I said, most of what I'm doing, as far as I'm concerned, isn't left versus right. It's, it's something other than that. And the only reason I got involved in political issues in Canada to begin with was because I thought that the politicians overstepped the political boundary and entered into a different realm. And that was a realm that I happened to hold rather dear. And so that was cast as a political issue, but for me it wasn't. It was a philosophical or even a theological issue. Now, with regards to free speech, I mean, for me, th the issue is quite clear. Is there such a thing as hate speech? Well, you have to be a bloody fool if you don't think there's such a thing as hate speech. I mean, I'm sure many of you have uttered hate speech when you're having a vicious argument with someone that you love. I mean, people say hateful things all the time. That's not the issue. The issue is, what do you do about it? And the answer is, well, you, you let the you let the utterances play themselves out in the public domain. And the reason for that is because there isn't a better solution. It's not because there's no hatred, but, but it's, also the case th it's also the case that defining hatred is a very tricky business, and who's going to define it is even a trickier business. And, you know, like in Scotland now, the police have posters up in the subways asking Scotsmen and Scotswomen to... Um, to turn each other into the police if they say something offensive. It's like, well, good luck thinking without being offensive. I mean, look, look at it this way. If you don't have a problem, you don't have to think because you don't have a problem. If you have a problem, then you have a problem and it varies in severity. And so let's say you have a serious problem. Well, if you have a serious problem, it's going to be emotionally engaging. It's really gonna matter to you how the problem is formulated and solved. It's actually going to matter. And so then you produce a diversity of opinions about the problem and how to solve it, because you need a diversity of opinions, because you have a problem and you want to solve it, but because it's emotionally engaging, you're going to find a certain number of the opinions distasteful, even hateful. Okay, well, well fair enough, but how are you going to protect yourself against that and still be able to think? And you might say, well, you don't need to think, which seems to be the default conclusion. It's like, good luck with that. Why do you have to think? You have to think because that's how you simulate the world. And so you simulate the world through thinking. You play out the consequences of a particular pattern of action. If the consequences are negative, then you don't embody the pattern of action. Then you don't die. So the reason that you think is so that you don't die. And if you're going to think about contentious things, then it's going to be offensive, terribly offensive. You're going to get the full range. And sometimes you're going to be wrong about being offended. It's like, you're wrong, seriously. And this thing you find so offensive, it's exactly what you need to correct your viewpoint. And that happens to people all the time in their life. You all know that. You know perfectly well that there are periods of time where you had to undergo a painful, radical, psychological transformation for your own good. And the way that you managed that was to learn something extremely bitter and distasteful. And if someone would have asked you, even while it was occurring, is this something you want to know? Are you happy about being exposed to it? The answer would be most definitively no. Because it leads you down into that state of disintegration that's necessary before you put yourself back together. And the right, right to be offensive is absolutely indistinguishable from the right to think. And so you interfere with that at your peril, especially as a consequence of like well-meaning compassion that's mostly aimed at what minimizing short-term conflict. It's just, it's, it's not, it's not. There's nothing in that that's going to have a positive outcome. All we'll get is polite people who say nothing offensive who can't think or produce art or anything of value and who can't solve problems and who avoid short-term conflict at all cost. And that's not a society I want to live in. So, and it's not a society that's going to have much, much of a lifespan in front of it. So. Okay. Well, let's do, yeah. I have one last question. Uh, let's do one last question. Um, Louis, yeah, what do you... <laughs>
maybe move a bit, like to keep it uh, I dynamic? I think we're definitely overprivileging the people at the top of yeah. the seated hierarchy yeah. in this particular discussion. <laughs> <laughs> so, Luis, maybe dive into that the side of the, the other side of the room. No, but Luis, maybe dive into the public for, for a last question. Maybe you guys can serve him. <laughs> Mr. Peterson, first of all, I am a huge fan, and honestly, I'm about to be 20 years old, and this is the greatest day of my life, hearing you speak. <laughs> <laughs> I can be honest. I, you, I'm, you. And I had a question, because uh, I understand what you're saying, and especially being in an academical setting, we are a huge number of students, and of course, we have to navigate towards many things, especially for people who have come from other countries and therefore different cultures. Uh, if you could give one advice to us how we could be able to actually put our opinion out there and to actually make people listen and not to cause some mindless conflict with just yelling. What advice would you give us? Learn to write. <laughs> I'm, I'm dead serious. Like, I'm dead serious about that. Um, because writing is formalized thinking. And so the way you write is, first of all, you need a problem. Because why write if you don't have a problem? So this is good advice if you're just writing an essay, by the way, for your classes. is like, pick a bloody problem that you want to write about, because otherwise it's false right from the start. It's up to you to engage with the material until you find something that grips you, that you desire to investigate. Okay, so you need a problem. Well, the next thing you need to do is, well, you need to have something to say about the problem. Well, so, reading. Reading is really good for that. Read as much as you can. Get your, your hands on that addresses the problem. Okay, so now, now, you, now you know a bunch of things, or at least provisionally know them. You at least have access to them. Well, now you start, you start sorting through it. It's like, okay, well, maybe I need to summarize what I've learned. And then I need to iron out the contradictions between what I've learned and I need to elegantly formulate that and, and I need to get my word choice right and my phrase choice right and my sentence choice right and I need to organize the sentences into proper paragraphs and the paragraphs into proper sequence so that I have a coherent argument and at the same time what you're doing is, is you're, 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 um, you're integrating your own personality at the highest and most abstract level of organization and you're sharpening your tools and you're putting yourself straight because you're learning to think. You learn to do that by writing. And so I would say, pick some hard problems and learn to write very, very carefully. And, I, and when I say pay attention to the word, I mean that, pick the right words, organize them into the right phrases, get your sentences straight. Like when I wrote my first book, Maps of Meaning, I believe I wrote every sentence in that book 50 times. 50 variants of every sentence. I'd read it once, I'd read it again, I'd read it again, I'd read it again, and I'd have a little competition. Which sentence is better? Which sentence is better? I'd pick that sentence. Do the same with the paragraphs. Over many, many years, you hone your words. They're, they're the most powerful thing about you, bar none. If you are an effective writer and speaker and communicator, you, you have all the authority and competence that there is. And so you're at university. Maybe you're taking a humanities degree. Well, that, what's the humanities degree for? It's to teach you how to think. You learn to think by writing. Now there's more to read, to speak, and all of that. But the best thing you can do is read and write every day. A couple of hours every day. Write about things you find important and see if you can See if you can discover what you believe to be true. And that'll build you a foundation. And it's unbelievably practical. Like if you look at people who are phenomenally successful across life, there's various reasons, but one of them is, is that they're unbelievably good at articulating what, they, what they're aiming at and strategizing and negotiating and, 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 and enticing people with a vision forward. 
It's like, get your words together, man. That's, that makes you unstoppable. And that, that's really, that's the core of the humanities, that idea. It's get your words together. Make yourself an articulate creature. And then you're, you're deadly in the best possible way. So, and take that seriously. And I'll, I'll end with something, too. You students, you might think in your more cynical moments that you have to offer your professors what they want and gerrymander the content of your language to suit their predilections or what you consider to be their predilections. First of all, it's a very small minority of professors who are corrupt enough to punish you for producing a high quality essay that they don't agree with. And, and though that's reprehensible, but it's, it, it doesn't happen very often. But more importantly, it's, it's, uh, it's the highest academic sin to do that. Because what you're here to do is to learn to find your true voice. And every time you deviate from that for expedient reasons, you corrupt yourself. And not in a trivial way. Because when you formulate your arguments, that, that becomes a permanent part of your character. You carry that with you. It becomes part of the structure through which you view the world. And it guides your actions. And so you hold your words pristine and you work in a dedicated way to become as articulate and clear as you can possibly become and there's nothing that's more practical and noble than that at the same time that's why the humanities are so valuable you know you think well what good is a humanities degree it's like well you come out of here able to speak and think and write no matter where you go like you're you're headed for for the pinnacle and hopefully in a in a in a way that's positive for everyone so that's what I would recommend. So Jordan Peterson, that was a very, um, very beautiful way to end the interview and the q and I think. Uh, we're almost already a bit over time, almost 10 minutes. But um, thank you for your passionate words, and um, yeah, again, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks very much. Woo.